every expectant mother knows that what she eats impacts her baby. And now research shows that is also true for our cows. Maternal consumption of Reassure during late gestation had a positive effect on the in utero calf, setting her up for better health and potentially even higher milk production once she joins the milking string. Learn more at balchemanh.com slash launch and launch your herd for life. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Real Science Lecture Series. My name is Scott Sorrell, Director of Global Marketing at Balchem. Today, we welcome Dr. Jim Drakeley from the University of Illinois to dis discuss the weaning transition in dairy calves. Dr. Drakeley is a professor of animal sciences at the University of Illinois. He received his PhD in nutritional physiology from Iowa State University. Since joining the faculty of University of Illinois in 1989, uh, his research program is focused on improving the health, welfare, and productivity of dairy cattle through nutrition. Specifically, his research deals with improving nutritional management of dairy cows during the dry period and transition to lactation and nutritional management of baby calves to improve health and growth. Dr. Drakeley has published extensively and received numerous awards for his research and work around the world. He served as on the latest uh, NASM committee to produce the eighth edition of the NASM publication, Nutrient Requirements of Dairy Cattle. Dr. Drakeley, uh, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Scott, for the introduction, and I'm happy to be here with you today to talk about one of my passions in the young calf. So today we're going to talk about we the weaning transition, which is the second transition period of, of dairy cattle production. And it's really talking about the period uh, preparing for and adapting to weaning. A very critical stage of the animal's life where she's subjected to many different stressors. There's a lot of changes around weaning and that sets up some uh, chance for stress in the young calf. By definition, there's a change in diet where we remove milk and we change to a total reliance on dry feed and free water. Although not recommended, perhaps there's a change from a starter formulation to a grower formulation at this time. There's a change in environment as the animal is moved to a different location, perhaps the first time in a, in a, a pen with other animals, and that can lead to social stressors of the the first grouping with other calves. There's also the removal of the surrogate mom, that is the caretaker that brings that nice warm liquid twice a day, uh, and the, the, the change to get away from the act of nursing or milk feeding. So these changes can lead to distress around the time of weaning. We often have growth slumps that are attributable to lower nutrient intakes and stress. Uh, we have adverse behavioral stress where there's increased vocalization and decreased resting. Increased disease susceptibility can result from these changes, particularly we deal with respiratory infections and coccidiosis during this time frame. And again, that's due to impaired immunity uh, from both suboptimal nutrition and from the weaning stressors. So let's look at the time leading up to the weaning transition. One of the changes that's happened over the last 10 to 15 years is that producers are feeding more milk or milk replacer to the young calf. The last national NOM survey conducted in 2014 showed that in the US, the average amount fed was 5.7 liters per day, which is equal to about 740 grams per day of milk solids. And that contrasts with an historical average of one to one and a quarter pounds of solids per day. So much greater intake of milk solids. Many farms are feeding six to more than eight liters per day. Along with this change, the death loss has declined over the same period. So our deaths in pre-weaned heifers declined from 11% of calves alive at 48 hours of age in 1996 to 6.4% in 2014. And it's likely that this is related to the better intake of nutrients during early life from a greater rate of milk feeding. 
Causes of death are largely unchanged, and scours and respiratory still account for about 80% of deaths. As you can see in the figure here, about two thirds of that is related to scouring and about one third to respiratory disease. So overall, we're doing better with the pre weaned calf, in my opinion. On average, then, fewer heifers will die post-weaning. And the NOMS data again showed that the mean mortality was only 2.7% of heifers born alive. So much lower expected rates of, of mortality on average. However, there are far too many train wrecks still at weaning time. Uh, an anecdotal uh, example of this is that three large dairies ranging from 12,000 to 20,000 cows reported death losses around winning of 20 to 30 percent of calves. Uh, and that's from Mike Van Amberg. Um, this is really not normal. This is unacceptable. And it highlights the, the uh, potential disasters that we can have around this time in the animal's life. This also affects post-weaning performance in animals that, that do not um, die. So here are data again from the 2014 NOMS report, looking at the changes in body weight over weaning and then 90 days of age, so post-weaning. I've shown data here both for Holsteins and Jerseys for completeness, should be cautioned that the Jersey data are based, based on much fewer observations so we'll just take a look here at the Holsteins. Again, on average, the pre-weaning performance is very good. The calves are more than doubling their birth weight. Um, the average daily gain of 730 grams per day. After weaning, however, the average daily gain slumped to only 0.6 kilograms per day. We can see that this is the same for, for Withers height, or hip height, excuse me. Uh, in that the, the average post-weaning gain is less than the pre-weaning gain. So we're losing performance here across the weaning transition. Why do so many calves struggle at weaning? Let's take a look at some of the factors that make this a, a particularly uh, 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 a time fraught with so many difficulties. First, let's look at Mother Nature's feeding program, thinking again of the evolution of dairy cattle on a, a grass uh, environment, spring calving animals. Cow's milk contains 25 to 26% protein on a dry solids basis, so higher than our uh, conventional milk replacers. The feeding rate is more than twice the rate of our so-called conventional feeding rate of milk replacers. So a kilo or a kilo and a half per day of solids versus about a half kilogram in our conventional feeding programs. And these feedings were spread over 12, six to 12 meals per day rather than two. The first solid feed would have been high quality fresh grass, which is very high in sugars and easily fermented fiber. That would lead to a greater butyrate production in the rumen which is necessary for the development of the rumen epithelium and papillae. And weaning was a gradual process at a much older age in life, six to 10 months of age versus four to eight weeks in our, uh, in our housed feeding systems. So a lot of differences based uh, uh, compared with the, the natural behavior of cattle. One of the things that happens during the weaning transition is that the empty body weight as a proportion of live weight decreases from before to after weaning. Now, empty body weight is the body weight minus the gastrointestinal tract fill or the, the digesta. In young milk fed calves that are receiving only milk, the empty body weight is 0.94 times the live body weight. In other words, 0.06 or 6% of the body weight as digesta in the tract. As the calf begins to eat starter, the proportion begins to decrease. So milk plus starter fed calf, NASM set the, the um, equivalence at 0.93 times the live body weight. However, by the time the calf is weaned, the empty body weight will only be 0.85 times the live body weight. So gut fill is increasing during the weaning transition. 
Let's look at how that impacts average daily gain. These are data from Jennifer Stamey Lanier's work here at the University of Illinois. And we fed a conventional uh, milk replacer, a low milk replacer, a high milk replacer plus, plus conventional starter, or high milk replacer plus a uh, high protein starter. The high rate of milk feeding, again, was about twice the, the uh, rate of the low milk intake. So post weaning here, or across the weaning transition, I should say, from week five to week 10, the average daily gains range from 0.83 up to 0.92 kilos per day. You can see the amount of digesta that was in the tract when we slaughtered calves at five weeks and 10 weeks of age, a great increase in the amount present at week 10. The average daily gain of body weight attributable just to the increase in gut fill is shown here, ranging from 0.21 kilo a day up to 0.28 kilogram per day. So about 25% or so of the average daily gain that we would measure in these calves was simply due to accumulating gut fill as the animal transitions from a pre-ruminant to a, a functioning ruminant. The empty body weight gain, which again would exclude that uh, digesta accumulation, is much lower and you can see that with the high protein starter, the empty body gain was actually greater than with the conventional starter, even with the high rate of, of milk feeding. The winning transition also affects the gastrointestinal tract mass itself. So again, this, the same study, the same treatments, we have the overall average daily gain shown here the weight of the gastrointestinal tract in five-week-old calves and the weight in 10-week-old calves shown for you here. The average daily gain that's attributable to the increase in gastrointestinal tract ranged from 0.09 kilos per day to 0.13 kilos today. So a good chunk of the, of the uh, average daily gain is actually coming from increases in the gastrointestinal tract and the relative proportion of body weight is greater at the time of weaning than at before weaning. So we have allometric growth of the gastrointestinal tract across the weaning transition. To avoid growth checks around weaning, we have to be focused on increasing starter intake, maximizing starter intake and its digestion pre-weaning before we're ready to wean the calves. Pre-weaning starter intake will account for much of the variation in post-weaning growth after we, we remove milk completely. So again, from one of Jennifer Stamey's studies, we have average daily gain during the, the week um, after weaning versus the pre-weaning starter dry matter intake taken the week before weaning. You can note a strong linear relationship here between those two variables. And if we look at a typical starter intake uh, recommended for weaning of 1,000 grams before weaning, or, or slightly more than two pounds, you can see that would be predicted to allow a 0.875 kilogram per day average daily gain in the week after weaning. But notice that there's many calves that are consuming much less than that, and their predicted gains would be much less than the 1,000 grams per day value. Dry matter intake in young calves is, is somewhat limited. So a milk-fed calf, uh, less than about 65 kilos body weight for Holstein, will consume about two and a quarter percent of its body weight as milk solids if they're fed ad libitum. That will gradually increase so that by the time the calf is greater than 65 kilos, they could consume about two and a half percent of body weight as milk solids. A survey of studies in the literature conducted for the NASM uh, publication showed that calves less than eight weeks of age fed, age fed a limited amount of milk and ad limitum starter consumed almost 2% of their body weight as total dry matter. That was from over 219 treatment means in 64 studies. Wean calves, however, will consume about 3% of their body weight as, as dry matter. And again, that's 79 treatment means from 27 studies summarized by NASM. 
maintenance energy in wean calves. Uh, the formulas for net energy and maintenance metabolizable energy are shown for you here. These values are greater than the previous NRC, but lower than in other systems across the world and lower also than in the beef NASM publication of 2016. But the important part to note here is that for a 45, or excuse me, 85 kilogram wean calf, we need about one kilogram per day of starter just for maintenance. So our recommendation that calves should be consuming about a kilo a day before weaning is only providing for maintenance um, needs of the calf, leaving very little for growth. Besides this, we might have environmental uh, uh, stressors that would increase the maintenance energy requirement. This table shows the increase in kilocalories of net energy needed for maintenance functions during heat stress, 40 or 35 degrees Celsius, or in cold stress at zero or minus 10 degrees Celsius. The requirements are, are affected more uh, in the young calf than in the calf more than three weeks of age, but we still might have increases in a, a calf around the time of weaning of upwards of 30 to 35% in environmental extremes. Therefore, that calf would grow even less uh, for a given intake of, of starter around the time of weaning. The NASM developed equations to predict starter intake in young calves being fed milk. The equation for you is, is quite complex, shown here, but it's a function of body weight, the metabolizable energy intake from the liquid diet, the age at which the starter is first provided, or in other words, a proxy for the age of the calf, and a couple of, of interaction terms here, or quadratic terms. This equation is, is quite robust in its ability to predict starter, uh, particularly as calves get a little bit older. And if we graph out a typical situation, the starter intakes would look like this, which is typical of, of many studies uh, shown for a, a calf consuming a relatively low amount of milk intake. A calf consuming higher milk intake will consume less starter early. Both calves respond quite quickly to a reduction in milk intake and in the, the time after weaning. Starter intake is so important because it drives rumen development. We're trying to develop several things in the, the young rumen. We're developing the size or volume of the rumen. That's driven primarily by the calf eating anything, whether it's, it's uh, uh, hay or starter. The musculature of the rumen is driven more by bulk, so it would be affected more by, by uh, fibrous feeds than by concentrates, but we usually don't have to worry too much about those two developing. The absorptive epithelium or papillae, that development is driven by volatile fatty acids produced by fermentation of, of dry feed intake. And then development of the microbial population, which again is driven by consumption of feed that produces volatile fatty acid and depends on the epithelium for acid absorption. So really we're focused on the latter two aspects here of developing the absorptive epithelium and the microbial population. The size and volume and the musculature are going to come along with, with consumption of, of feed in general. As we think about the effects of diet that on rumen development, milk and hay do little to develop rumen epithelium. Um, hay is just too poorly digested to uh, contribute to VFA formation and rumen development. Starter grain providing starch or fresh grass providing sugars is the key to development of rumen papillae via, via VFA production. The papillae development can occur by three to four weeks of age with good starter management, and the process takes about three weeks no matter when we start. Here's what we're trying to develop. This is a rumen and, and reticulum. Reticulum and rumen here shown in a six week old calf that was fed milk only. You can see the pale color and the smooth surface of the rumen 
there's very little, if any, papillae development. In a six-week-old calf that's been fed milk and grain, we see a very different picture. The rumen is, and reticulum are dark in color, and the rumen is covered with a, a, a shag rug type of, of structure of the papillae, and we have very pronounced development of the honeycomb structure of the reticulum. If we have insufficient rumen development, so not enough starter intake before weaning, we will have decreased nutrient digestibility after weaning. This is a study from Spain in which they measured digestibility in calves after weaning for calves that were fed either low or high amounts of milk replacer. The apparent digestibility of dry matter, crude protein, fiber, and energy are all reduced about 7% except you can see the dramatic reduction in fiber digestion for the calves that were fed the larger amount of milk. Now, again, this is due to the fact that those calves had been consuming relatively less starter uh, compared with the calves fed the lower amount of milk. So their rumen is, is more highly developed than the calves that were fed the high amount of milk. NDF digestibility, in my view, is a particularly robust indicator of the status of rumen development. As a consequence, the actual metabolizable energy obtained from digestion may be lower than the calculated value if the rumen is not fully developed. And that was shown in a nice set of studies by Jim Quigley and his group at Provimi. This is common, again, in calves fed large amounts of milk. In the NASM 2021 model, users have the option to use a discounted ME value for starter for calves that are consuming larger amounts of milk. Now, as the calf approaches weaning, the tissue requirements for energy and amino acids do not change. The, the requirements at the tissue level for energy and amino acids stays the same for a given rate of, of body weight gain. Also, the efficiency of use of the metabolizable energy from VFAs and the milk digestion end products is not greatly different. But there are large differences in digestibility of those two diets. The metabolizable energy of starter is only 60 to 70 percent of the ME in milk replacer or whole milk. So the growth expected will be only about two thirds of that on an equal dry matter consumption from milk replacer. To illustrate this in another way, let's look at the starter dry matter intake that's required to support various rates of gain in weaned calves mm -hmm. of two different body weights. So we have calf body weights of 60 or 80 kilograms at weaning, perhaps uh, uh, thinking of jerseys versus Holsteins, and two different average daily gains before weaning, 600 or 800 grams per day. The starter required to fuel that same amount of growth after weaning is shown here and ranges from about 1.7 kilo a day up to two and a quarter kilos a day. Again, because of differences in energy content of starter and its availability and use by calves, we would need 1.4 to 1.7 times more starter than milk replacer for the same amount of body weight gain. So let's con uh, consider some factors then, given this background, that contribute to poor weaning performance and traumatic weanings. There are a number of factors which we'll consider here. Weaning too early, weaning from high amounts of milk that's not gradual enough, too much forage, poor starter quality or composition that is too high in starch, poor palatability or has particle size issues, poor water management and stacking stressors at weaning. We'll go through each of these starting with weaning too early. As we've mentioned already, calves that are fed greater amounts of milk have lower starter intakes at a given age than calves fed a limited amount of milk. You can see that in this example, uh, the consumption of starter is quite low until we start the weaning process and the, the calves fed a, a larger amount of milk in an intensified system 
uh, begin to catch up. But at the time of weaning, the starter intake was considerably lower and the calves fed the intensified milk replacer. This can result in weaning slumps. So here we have a different study with similar design. Uh, the weaning causes a um, uh, reduction in average daily gains. Calves are still gaining, just not as rapidly. Whereas we have a, a relatively smooth pattern of increasing average daily gain in the conventionally fed calves. Note that uh, uh, by a week after weaning, the average daily gains have equalized again. Here we have daily starter intake around the time of weaning, just to show the pattern of intake increase in calves. So again, three dietary groups here with a low rate of, of feeding or conventional rate of feeding, a high rate of milk feeding with a 22% protein starter, and a high rate of milk feeding with an 18% uh, crude protein starter. You'll note that when we went to uh, one feeding per day, the starter intake increases quite quickly for two to three days after that change and then tends to plateau again at that uh, new level of milk feeding. One week later at complete weaning, again, the same pattern. We have increases in starter intake for all the groups for two to three days before reaching more of a plateau. Uh, also interesting that the 22% protein starter seems to increase more quickly uh, at the time of weaning than the lower protein starter. This is a study from Mike Steele's group, and it shows the two different weaning ages for calves that were fed up to eight liters of milk per day. You look at the milk consumption pattern here, you can see they're both fed eight liters of milk for several weeks. Uh, the, the weaning calves at six weeks per age with a reduction in milk for one week, and then a complete weaning or weaning beginning at eight weeks of age, uh, showing a, a, a partial decrease and then the complete weaning by, by uh, uh, eight weeks of age. The calves that were weaned at six weeks of age had a growth slump. You can see in the, the bottom figure where the weights of the calves um, slow, the increase slows here and becomes less than the calves that were weaned at eight weeks of age. That can be explained by the intake of energy in, in the calves. This is metabolizable energy intake. You can see this curve is the starter intake and that's increasing slowly. And by the time of weaning here in the six week weaning age, the starter intake is quite low and not contributing very much to the metabolizable energy intake. So the total, um, total metabolizable energy intake um, is quite low around the time of weaning, or we have a large decrease from the time pre-weaning to after weaning. In the eight-week calves, the starter intake has increased uh, to a greater extent, and so there's very little decrease in metabolizable energy intake, or certainly much less of a decrease than in the six-week wean calves. This is another study from, uh, from Canada, and it compares three treatments, a, a low-fed group consuming about five liters of, of milk per day and weaned at eight weeks of age, a group fed considerably more, about twice as much milk, but also weaned at eight weeks of age, and a group consuming a, a high amount of milk for a much longer period and not weaned until 14 days, uh, excuse me, 14 weeks of age. Starter intake for those groups is shown here. The low milk fed groups had the greatest intake. The early weaned high milk groups were slightly lower in starter intake as we might expect. And the late weaned group was uh, maintaining quite a low intake of starter until the weaning process began at 11 weeks of age. The weight gains during weaning, the mean gain here was, was uh, not different between the um, low milk early weaned group and the high milk late weaned group, but a, a considerable loss of weight gain here in the calves that were fed high amounts of milk and weaned early. 
that carried over also to the period after weaning. And so really setting up calves to be at a disadvantage around weaning by weaning them too early. A second factor is weaning from high amounts of milk that is not gradual enough to abrupt uh, at weaning. This was a study from uh, British Columbia that shows uh, the effects of age, or excuse me, of time of weaning on, on performance of the calves. So if we look at the patterns here, the, the different treatments, we had a group that was, fed, that was weaned gradually over a period of 22 days leading up to complete weaning by day 42. We had another group that had a 10-day uh, weaning reduction. That's this line here. So 10 days of gradual reduction, a group with four days of gradual reduction, and a group with no reduction that was weaned abruptly at 42 days of age. If we look at the starter intake for those groups, the abrupt weaning had a much lower starter intake. The four-day weaning also was lower in starter intake, but the 10-day and 22-day uh, weaning were, were similar. The body weights then shown here, the abruptly weaned calves um, had lost average daily gain here around the time of weaning. The, um, 22 day weaning calves never gained as much because they were being reduced in milk intake at an early age. The 10 day and the four day were relatively similar, but overall the 10 day appeared to be the best compromise between uh, providing enough growth from the high milk intake and ensuring adequate starter intake at the time of weaning. So we certainly do not recommend abrupt weaning and a period of a week to 10 days of gradual milk reduction seems to be optimum. This was a study from our group just showing uh, the effects of gradual weaning here. Uh, we had two, three weaning reductions, excuse me, before complete weaning from quite a high intake of, of milk replacer. You can see starter intake is increasing in a nice uh, curvilinear pattern and the average daily gain then, while some variability was generally maintained here across the weaning transition. A third factor leading to poor weaning performance is too much forage fed before and, and around the time of weaning. Uh, ad libitum forage feeding can certainly harm the, the weaning transition if it's the wrong type of forage. Calves that are fed ad libitum hay and limited concentrates do not grow as well and are often in poor health after weaning compared with calves that are, are fed limited or no amounts of, of hay. As we mentioned before, the digestion of hay is very poor in young calves. Part of this is due to the fact that rumen pH is very low before weaning you can see in this study that, that pH after feeding drops very low, below 5.5 for much of the day, even when fed some hay. And we have to have room and pH around six in order for uh, the establishment of the cellulose or fiber digesting bacteria. And so we're, we're not able to, to establish good populations of those microorganisms until we can achieve a stable pH of six. As a result, the digestibility of NDF is, is very low. If we look at the NDF digestibility in this study that uh, had starters with alfalfa meal and wheat bran with no forage, the NDF digestibility is only averaging about 30% or, or less even in the, the younger calves. That's compared with digestibility of other components of the diet, for example, fatty acids, where digestibility is 80%. So certainly we're, we're struggling at an early age with fiber digestibility, indicating that hay is, is, or forage is not going to be well utilized. This is a, an older study from, <clears throat> excuse me, from England, where they fed increasing amounts of grain and free choice hay then was decreasing as we went to the uh, across the treatments here. 
The gastrointestinal tract contents were much greater for calves fed the greater amounts of forage and the average daily gains were lower for the higher forage and increased as we fed more grain. The empty body gain, again, taking out that gut fill is, is even more dramatic, showing increases from only 0.14 kilo a day with the lowest amount of grain up to about 0.43 kilos of, of gain per day with the higher amounts of grain. As we mentioned earlier, 73% of the average daily gain was due to gut and fill, and that dropped to only 38% at the higher amounts of, of grain feeding. So forage here certainly was a, a negative contributor to performance. On the other hand, smaller amounts of forage have in many studies been shown to improve performance of the calves. In a study from Iowa State University, they fed a coarse textured starter, a ground starter, or a uh, ground starter plus chopped hay, 7.5% uh, 7 of the dry matter, or 15% of the dry matter in the H2 group. Note that the average daily gains uh, were slightly lower for the ground starter, um, but the gains for the calves that were consuming some forage, particularly the 7.5% um, brome grass hay, are considerably greater. As a result, the gain to feed was improved for those calves. In a second trial with the same treatments, the results were not statistically significant, but there's a, a similar pattern if we look across means, indicating that a small amount of forage may actually be beneficial in young calves. Another study from uh, Canada and John Kant's group showed that calves that were fed a uh, starter with alfalfa meal incorporated into it had greater pre-weaning dry matter intakes and greater post-weaning dry matter intakes than calves that were fed a controlled diet of steam flake corn or a diet with a similar amount of, of cracked corn. The gain to feed was uh, tending to be greater for the addition of the higher amount of hay, uh, but again, a high amount of digesta in those calves the carcass adjusted body weight gains, in other, other words, removing the effects of the gut fill, um, were improved in the calves that received the diet containing forage. To explain the, the uh, somewhat divergent and variable results of looking at forage feeding, I think this study from Alex Box group in, in Spain is instructive. In these studies, they fed no forage to a group of calves, or they fed calves that had ad libitum access to alfalfa hay, oat hay, barley straw, ryegrass hay, or corn silage, as well as several other treatments that are, are not shown here. This shows the ratio of forage to concentrate that the calves actually selected based on ad libitum access to either forage or grain and the resultant average daily gains in those studies. Note that the calves that were fed no forage had an average daily gain of 0.72 kilos per day. Calves that had access to alfalfa consumed the highest amount of forage relative to concentrate, and that gain was not statistically different than from the calves that received no forage. However, calves that had access to the other hays or straw or corn silage consume less forage relative to concentrate and also had greater average daily gains. We can see visually that calves love uh, high quality alfalfa hay. This was on a farm in China where the calves had access to very nice uh, dairy quality alfalfa hay and ad libitum pellets of starter and note that there's only a, a handful of calves here eating the starter and many calves that are consuming the hay. So back to this table here, I think to put it in perspective, we need to remember that at a relatively low total dry matter intake, say of 1.5 kilos, 
Forage intake would only be about 75 grams per day versus the barley straw versus 210 grams per day for the alfalfa hay. So the calves that are offered a poorer quality roughage or forage will consume much less relative to high quality alfalfa hay. So a summary in my view of forage recommendations, we should not feed free choice alfalfa hay to calves before and after starter, uh, before and after weaning, excuse me. It decreases starter intake. It's very palatable, but has low digestibility because of its high lignin content. Small amounts of chopped grass, haze, or straws, and here we're talking about less than 100 grams per day or 5% of the total diet, will actually increase starter consumption and feed efficiency. We should also limit the amount of alfalfa hay offered through at least six months of age so that calves consume all of the programmed concentrates. A good solution here is, is a, a feed line where calves have ad libitum access to a textured starter and just a sprinkling of some chopped oat hay on top. And this is enough uh, forage to allow the calf to consume a, a small amount and perhaps augment their performance as we've seen in the, the previous slides. The next factor we'll consider is starter quality or composition. Again, we don't want the, cat, the starter to be too high in starch, have poor palatability, or be, um, uh, have particle size issues. Some characteristics of good starters should be palatable ingredients, sufficient fiber to keep the rumen healthy. We generally recommend more than 15% NDF with some minimal particle size requirement not dusty or too many fines present, protein for the rumen and post-ruminal digestion. Uh, we mentioned earlier the, the potential benefits of higher protein starters. We should avoid whole oil, whole oil seeds and high fat contents, and also corn byproducts seem to be less palatable. As a visual representation, this was a study in Iran uh, where they were fed a ground starter, a texturized starter, a pelleted starter, or the ground starter plus chopped alfalfa hay at 10% of the, the total offering. The rumen development, <clears throat> excuse me, in these calves shown for the, the same orientation, the ground starter, texturized starter, and the, part, the pelleted starter all showed some evidence of clumping of the rumen papillae, which is not necessarily uh, the, the best rumen papillae development, but the calves fed the forage and the, the ground concentrate had a nice papillae structure. Again, highlighting the importance of some fiber and the potential benefits of, of some forage fiber in the, in the diet. Digestible fiber versus sugars and starch is another uh, content of uh, uh, topic of interest currently. Typically, starch content of starters has been 35 to 40 percent of dry matter, and there's been concern recently that this contributes to very low rumen pH in transitioning calves, where they might be below five for much of the day, and certainly in a, an adult ruminant that would not be healthy. The trend in the industry has been towards lower starch and higher digestible fibers and higher sugars, although comparative data are limited. This is a starter formulation from one of Mike Van Amberg's studies, just showing the, the concept here of uh, ingredients in a pellet, by, some bypass protein, um, wheat mids, canola meal, sugar, dried whey, also contributing sugars, some blood meal, rumen protected methionine, minerals, vitamins, and additives, along with then flaked corn, um, a relatively high amount of beet pulp, and molasses. So such a starter has a nutrient profile looking like this, about 25% protein, or in other words, a 22% as fed starter, um, moderate in NDF content and low in starch content uh, compared with some of our high starch starters, high in sugars as well. So very favorable to rumen development. Another factor contributing to poor weaning uh, success is poor water management. And as an example here, we have these nice 
calf pens and a nice calf bowl, but it's uh, completely dry. Water certainly is an important nutrient. We need milk or milk replacer that, um, or excuse me, milk or milk replacer bypasses the rumen, whether fed by nipple or bucket. So we need water to enter into the rumen and support the microbial environment. For one kilo of starter intake, we need about four liters of water intake. And if we have inadequate water intake, there'll be less starter intake and decreased growth. Um, just a study again from Mike Steele's group with the six versus eight week weaning. But the point here is that the patterns of water consumption and starter consumption are almost identical. Finally, it's, uh, the final str uh, stressor that we'll consider is stacking stressors at the time of weaning. And if we think of stresses, stressors as being like a tower of blocks, if we stack too many stressors at the same time, eventually that tower is going to collapse and will lead to disease or, or even death in calves. Particularly, we should avoid uh, uh, additional management stressors such as dehorning or vaccination at the same time as the calves are subjected to the um, social stressors and nutritional stressors of weaning. So again, to summarize, to avoid these traumatic weanings, we don't want to wean too early, we want to wean gradually, not feed too much forage, feed a high quality starter, provide fresh water, and not stack stressors around weaning. With that, I, I thank you for your attention and will be glad to address some questions. All right. Thank you, Dr. Drakely. Uh, before we get started answering questions, uh, I'd like to share a brief video and then we'll be right back to answer the questions submitted during today's presentation. The heat of summer is coming and it can have a big impact on your cows. Niacher Precision Release Niacin is the perfect complement to traditional heat abatement strategies to help keep her cool from the inside. Using Balcom's proprietary encapsulation process, Niacher delivers eight times more bioavailability than raw niacin, leading to an increase in sweating and vasodilation to reduce internal body temperature and support maximum productivity. Learn more at balcomanh.com cool and keep her cool from the inside. All right, as a reminder, you can still submit questions through the Q&A tab at the top of your screen. Uh, Dr. Drakeley, your first question is, um, can fresh grass for pre-weaned calves contribute to bloat issues uh, in calves? Um, that's a, a good question. I think that um, anything that is, is more digestible um, might have the potential to be a contributor to bloat, but in general, um, we don't see bloating on, um, on calves that are consuming uh, moderate quality grasses. Perhaps it's a concern with a, a very high quality grass product, but we generally don't see that. All right, next question. What are your thoughts on feeding a true TMR with silages to post weaned calves? Yeah, there's been uh, some studies that have looked at that. <clears throat> I think the the um, process or the, the concept is fine. It contributes um, um, some um, fiber the, to contribute to digestible fiber. Um, but again, we um, 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 the one concern is that we want to keep that material fresh. And so the, the higher moisture TMRs need to be cleaned out from the calf bunk on a regular basis to prevent spoilage. All right. Next question comes from Akeem. Um, are the approximate 25% to 30% uh, average daily gains due to gut fill gain a um, uh, stable size? I'm sorry, Scott. Can you repeat that? Yeah. Are the, um, are the approximate 25 to 30 percent average daily gains due to gut milk gain? Uh, and then it says a stable size. Um, not sure if he's asking for consistency there or what. Yeah. So 
So that's measured in the study that I presented, that was measured from week five to week 10. So that's on average across that time period. Um, I think it's going to be um, larger than that at some point during that time frame as the, the calves are ramping up their starter consumption. But again, on average across that weaning period, that's the, the, a, a magnitude that we would expect um, in terms of weight at five weeks versus weight at 10 weeks. All right. Yeah. Uh, Akeem just uh, qualified that and he says, is this the size that we, we should count on? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, Dr. Mike is asking in calf starters, uh, forage per particle size varied from pellets to meal to long per uh, particles. Uh, your thoughts? Yeah, I think the the small size in a pellet um, provides uh, the chemical fiber. Um, if the particle size is, is too small, um, we might not have the mechanical effects of the uh, abrasion on the rumen wall and so on that we uh, that we need the fiber to do. So um, usually the particle size is, um, and I'm forgetting my micron sizes here at the moment, but um, particle size in a pellet is, is kept at a minimum size that will still provide a little abras abrasive factor as the pellet disintegrates in the, the young rumen. Um, and of course, the, the particle size in a texturized starter is, is larger and it would be even more pronounced than if we actually had chopped forage along with the, the starter. All right. Uh, Dr. Christine uh, is asking, general recommendations for starter intake at weaning time is two pounds for three days. I do not think this is an appropriate general recommendation. Can you uh, improve on this genetic recommendation as an industry guideline for Holsteins, for example? Yeah, I think as, as some of my data showed this morning or today, um, the, the one kilo a day or two pounds per day recommendation is, is likely not enough. Um, that is only supporting maintenance needs of the calf and doesn't allow for growth. So I think a, probably a more appropriate guideline would be two and a half ki uh, pounds of, of dry matter intake for three days as an indicator. Okay, next question. Uh, what is the ideal particle size for chopped forages mixed with calf starter? Uh, generally, we recommend about uh, an, in, an inch or a couple of centimeters in, in length. Um, that seems to be the, the, the best compromise to improve utilization in terms of reducing waste, uh, but also a good size for calves to chew and, and deal with. Okay. Uh, related, uh, GMR is asking, uh, what kind of hay do you prefer mixed with starter and in what percentage? Yeah, again, something like uh, chopped straw even is, is uh, sufficient and uh, a, a, a medium quality grass hay would be, would be fine. And generally, we'd want to limit that to about 5% of the, the starter that we're offering. Okay. Um, Derek is asking, are there issues with feeding high fat calf starters to calves? Yeah, in general, the, the research that's looked at higher fat contents has not been very positive. There are some studies with, with relatively modest inclusions of um, less than 3% fats that, that do show some benefits, particularly in colder environments. Uh, but higher fat feeding in an effort to increase energy intake has really not been successful. So we would generally recommend um, uh, just modest fat levels and, and focusing on getting intake of starter uh, with fermentable carbohydrates, which is really what's going to drive the rumen development and, and the gains during this period. All right. Next question uh, from Michael. How much consideration and research is given to in utero nutrition as it relates to preparing the, the calf's immune function and uh, subsequent performance? A very, very interesting question. Um, there's much more interest now in possible epigenetic effects occurring within the, the mother before birth. 
Um, a number of studies recently are, are starting to look at the effects of what, what uh, dry period nutrition of the mother is, is having on the calves as well. So I think we'll see a lot more um, evaluation of different nutritional strategies during the dry period on the performance of their calves as we continue to move forward now. Okay, Sherry is asking, uh, if starter protein is lower than you would like, uh, would it help to top dress either a little soy or alfalfa meal? Um, we could we could do that. Uh, I think the, the concern is we'd like to have that all in more of a, a quote, TMR uh, type of approach rather than, than separating the the uh, ingredients, but, um, that, that could be done as a temporary measure. All right. Next question is from Caleb. What are your thoughts on feeding a sodium bicarbonate or anti-caking agent to, uh, calves before, during, or after weaning? Yeah, the, the, the research on sodium bicarb is, is, uh, somewhat mixed. I think there's a, um, um, there, there may be some benefit, but it's, it's not a strong benefit. Certainly the anti-caking agents um, uh, may have some impact on starter texture that, that could improve consumption and prevent fines and so on. All right, next question is from Alberto. Uh, um, extruded corn, is it better than ground corn for development of calves? Yeah, I think that the processing of the corn, anything that we can do to improve starch digestibility is going to have a, a generally positive effect on the, the rumen development. Okay, next question from Peter. Is feeding calves in pairs, the buddy system, still recommended? Uh, this was a bit of a hot topic for a while, but I haven't heard much about it lately. Yeah, I think that, that it's um, that the... Um, research and, and discussion about it has kind of cooled off. I, I think there's um, there's been a mixed reception to that in the field. Many producers are, are satisfied with it, and certainly it's, um, in my opinion, it's, it's a better environment for the calves, but some people have found it difficult to, to manage depending on the, the age of the calves, and of course you have to deal with with possibly more aggressive calves trying to steal the other one's milk allotment and so on. So I, I think the, the, the concept is still very valid and um, there, there's continuing work on pair or group, uh, group housing for calves. Okay. Uh, Maria is asking, uh, when you are offering eight liters daily in two doses, at what age do you consider lowering the amount? At 35 days? or uh, lose two liters per week? So yeah, I think um, the, the reduction, we have to be careful from that at high um, an amount of milk. Um, personally, I would recommend that we go to about six weeks of age and then have a couple of steps down in the, the milk offered over the next two weeks so that we end up weaning by, by eight weeks of age. Okay. Uh, Dr. Drakely, we are at the top of the hour. Do you have a few moments for a couple more questions? Sure. All right. Um, does the timing of significant amounts of calf starter intake relative to weaning reduce weaning transition stress and performance? I think certainly, yes. Um, we want the calves to be increasing in starter intake and at an adequate level for some time prior to weaning so that the calf is able to use that starter in adequate amounts to continue to provide maintenance and, and an allowance for growth. Okay. Uh, and what is your current recommendations for level and schedule of milk replacer feeding? I think the, the, um, I would like to see a, a minimum of six liters of milk or milk replacer per day uh, at, at the peak. Um, and that can be achieved fairly quickly. There's, there's been a feeling that, you know, we need to kind of work the calves up in the amounts offered. But there's been, 
a couple of studies recently that have shown that placing calves on a higher amount of milk, uh, basically from birth, that the calves will consume most of that and, and be able to deal with it. Um, if going up to eight liters per day, I'm not sure we want to, to offer the full eight liters twice a day, but uh, certainly we could be offering, offering six liters a day from uh, soon after birth and transition milk. Um, after that, maintaining the, the higher level of milk, again, up until about 42 days, and then uh, a, a step down or two steps down, weaning towards, uh, uh, towards eight weeks of age. All right. And our last question comes in from Stefano. Do you have any tips to stimulate early calf starter intake in pre-weaned calves? I think making it available and keeping it fresh in small amounts is, is important. Um, uh, again, some people try to introduce some in, by hand feeding into the, the calves, but that's uh, uh, more difficult with larger numbers of calves. But I think this starting them out early with, with small amounts and keeping it fresh is a, uh, is a good way to encourage early, develop, early consumption. All right. Thank you, Dr. Drakeley. This has been a very interesting webinar, and thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar. If you have additional questions, please submit them to anh.marketing at balchem.com. The Real Science Lecture Series of webinars continues on August 1st with Wild Yeasts and Aerobic Stability of Silages and TMR with Dr. Lehman Kung from the uh, University of Delaware. Visit balchem.com slash real science for more details and to register for all future webinars. Balchem's podcast series continues to offer a deeper dive into our webinar topics. Log on to your favorite podcast platform and search for Real Science Exchange or visit balchem.com slash podcast. If you want a really cool Real Science Exchange t-shirt, just subscribe to the Real Science Exchange. Send us a screenshot along with your um, shirt size and address to anh dot marketing at balchem.com and we'll get that off to you right away on behalf of balchem and dr drakely thank you for joining us today <music>